Good morning to everybody. And nice to see you here in Tallinn. And thank you, Daniela, for your kind uh, introduction. But I have to say I have never been Minister of Culture. <laughs> it was worse. I was Minister of Social Affairs. <laughs> and uh, it was a short time, but very terrible time. The time of the big transformation of Estonia and other countries in Eastern Europe from the Soviet camp to the camp of freedom. And we really know what does it mean to live in society, transforming. But uh, this big transformation of the 90s, it, in this sense, was different because we knew, knew where we are going. Uh, we had like a gate ahead uh, with a title, free society, and we thought that it's okay, this is this direction we are going, in this direction. On our journey we discovered that it's not so simple, uh, but unfortunately, uh, in this first period, uh, people didn't really think a lot about social and cultural implications. Uh, we had on the forefront uh, economic agenda, uh, you know, it was time of the flourishing neoliberalism. Uh, everything seemed to be measurable. Everything seemed to be linear and simple. And uh, only maybe after five years, uh, social sciences, not speaking about humanities, not, not ever, uh, were coming uh, to the room of decision making and started to make some noise, but also for many, many years, uh, these voices were not listened. And what we have now, a lot of problems still not solved. Uh, very much they are also due uh, to this situation in the beginning of transformation where really social sciences and the humanities, uh, they were like left aside and uh, not asked about consequences, not asked about the problems, and uh, now we have to catch up in many, many directions here. Uh, already it was said that Estonia is, <coughs> is a country where people are very prone uh, of technological changes. Uh, in some way, it, it is felt that, yes, technology, that's okay, uh, it's, it's just, it's simple, it's uh, uh, progressive, uh, in contrast with what people think about politics, for example. Uh, but uh, all we here in this hall, we who have been dealing with the problems of uh, media changes, technological changes, and now in the most general way uh, with the digital age, uh, we already know that it's not like that that really technological change, all those inventions, they also could produce a lot of uh, inequality, injustice, uh, and, and so on and so on. And then for that, uh, uh, I put question in my title of presentation, uh, how to remain human in automated society, meaning that we already very much are living in automated society, even without digital. We are living in society where people have started to behave like they are automated. When we look and listen uh, to the uh, talks, uh, to the decision-making uh, argumentations, uh, uh, to complaints of people, that very often there is a feeling that people are not meeting humans uh, who are capable to understand variety and, and uh, diversity and, and complexity of the real living situation, but they're encountering social robots who have programmed and algorithmized in a way that to be as, say, standardized, as, uh, say, exact, uh, not to be involved in this kind of human complications. And I suppose that uh, this is quite uh, important uh, to feel that it could be some kind of 
adaptation with this future situation of uh, roboticized uh, environment in a way that people are starting to behave like robots, not people are behaving like humans. And that, for me, is one of major issues, really. How not even to remain, but how to become more human, how to become really humane uh, in order to be capable uh, encounter these uh, new developments in this digitalized uh, age. Uh, when all of us who have been dealing with uh, uh, studies uh, connected with uh, new media, with uh, uh, <coughs> digital inventions on labor market or, or in a, on any other field, uh, until very recent, have felt ourselves like uh, we have been dealing with all those issues in different compartments. We were like in a trade. Everybody in own wagon, in their own surrounding, with uh, small, uh, well-defined issues, uh, uh, scientific questions, uh, methodologies, and it, it was like uh, moving toward this uh, digital society as some kind of city on horizon, something which is far, still far away. We are, feel that we are there, we know where we are, we are moving, but we are still not there. But now, after COVID, where really people who never thought about any kind of digitalized work or digitalized communication overnight, were, for example, locked in their homes with the kids, uh, have distance learning that never been prepared to have, or teachers uh, who started to use uh, video instruction without any preliminary training to do that, but they learned very quickly. Uh, people started to think about this digital life, digital society as a practical reality, not as something uh, that's general goal, but as practical reality. Now, even more tragically, this terrible war of Russia against Ukraine have brought on the forefront all reality which is connected with using uh, this, uh, say, uh, achievements uh, of digitalization uh, on the battlefield. Yes, we are glad when we see how Ukrainians are capable to uh, to fight Russian drones, uh, but in general, using drones uh, on battlefield is something which is not regulated in any way. We know that, uh, that all these problems connected with this uh, uh, artificial intelligence, uh, they are not regulated. I was, as it was said, member of the uh, European Parliament. Uh, it was uh, from 2016 to 2019, and I was in a working group uh, which created this uh, famous GDPR. I, I, I apologize. <laughs> I, 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 one of authors of that document. But, but when I, today I signed, and you all, we all signed this, uh, uh, I said, the paper for GDPR um, about uh, allowing streaming then it is uh, now like very simple, but a lot of complicated problems which are related to GDPR, they are not solved. Uh, and again, for example, uh, in this text, we put task to commission and to developers to ensure that all those uh, privacy uh, uh, regulations, all those uh, mm, uh, privacy settings will be translated in a human language. So that it's not uh, the complicated, uh, not readable, not understandable text, but it, sh we imagine, should be like uh, traffic lights, like traffic regulations, that you recognize where are the real risks and where there are no risks. And you act according to that, that there is a, this language, a codification of risks. Now we have it, uh, the GDPR working since uh, uh, 2018, yeah, already five years almost. Nothing like that we see. 
No, no efforts to make this uh, codification of risks connected with privacy so that people can easily understand what they should, what they should avoid or what should they, they, they easily uh, can agree with. And the result is that in this bureaucratic automated society what we have, uh, in our research, in all our steps uh, in this information field, we see how GDPR is used to block to block research, to block some steps, because there is no willingness and also no knowledge among decision makers about the real digital risks for privacy. And this is a small example if you compare it with a huge challenge to regulate artificial intelligence. We know that now the very prominent people have made manifesto uh, declaration uh, to stop development of artificial intelligence or application artificial intelligence until it will be regulated. My experience is saying that to achieve this situation of regulation, even the process of regulation to be started, it, it is enormously difficult. And here we are coming to the main problem of this same issue how to be human in automated society. To be human on the first place for me means to be capable for responsible decision making. To be responsible not uh, formally, but morally, uh, looking at the basic values. Now there is a very good development uh, concerning uh, so-called digital humanism. I suppose that uh, all of you, or majority of you, have, have read the manifesto, Vienna Manifesto, Digital Humanism. Uh, and in this kind of uh, text deliberations, it is taken for granted that we know what really are human values, that we really appreciate responsibility, that we really want to keep for humans the, uh, say, core uh, core position in this uh, development concerning uh, uh, implementation and development of the new uh, uh, artificial intelligence uh, 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 applications. But I have big doubts concerning that. Uh, it was said that uh, Estonia, yes, it's a country where uh, there are a lot of applications already in use, uh, e-voting, e-governance, uh, all those nice things. Uh, but from other side, uh, it all, uh, also is uh, telling that people could be quite, uh, uh, say, uh, lightheaded in some way, uh, taking these kind of changes uh, like for granted that they are for good. But if we now are confronting this new situation, uh, really this uh, <coughs> chat robots, you know, it was like a wake-up call. Suddenly, all started to speak about the uh, need to understand what are the implications, what are the risks, not to go further before we <coughs> can, can understand <coughs> where is this, uh, let's say, human and social uh, risk with that, but we have to <coughs> admit that <coughs> very often we not only don't have uh, <coughs> will, but we don't have knowledge uh, to understand these risks. And we don't have knowledge to teach people how to behave, how to remain human in this situation. And for that I will go directly to my conclusions. <laughs> because, because, you can, <laughs> because all this transformation, you, you, you know what are these uh, possible problems uh, with uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, it, it's, uh, it's nothing new here. But the problem is, what is this challenge for our sciences, for humanities and social sciences? Are we capable to deal with deconstruction of all those illusions, but from other side, all those mythologies and fears connected with this development. Uh, how we can uh, empower people, how we can develop uh, reflexivity or using uh, concept developed by 
lately deceased and, and uh, very respected here by, by our researchers, Margaret Archer, the meter reflexivity, the meter reflexivity which is really core capability of human being to understand oneself and, and the, the consequences of own activities. Uh, how we can uh, use uh, all these uh, uh, new possibilities of uh, um, data mining, uh, uh, big data, uh, to understand better our own uh, history, and not own history in terms of the national history, but history of humankind, because now there is enormous possibilities to do something what really was my dream, and I was the student, the postgraduate student, then I dreamed it was in, uh, in the late 60s, uh, that there could be research which can bring out the changes in the human values throughout all civilizations, throughout all history. But then it was a dream, it was a fantasy. Uh, it ended with content, content analysis of local newspaper. <laughs> but, 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 uh, but now it is possible <coughs> with, with these new capacities, it is possible. And it is possible to use this uh, knowledge uh, for uh, uh, developing the new level of uh, intercultural communication, but we don't have still knowledge and even maybe we don't have initiatives in this direction. Then <coughs> about education, that's a major thing, how to change education so that the people will be fit uh, to meet all challenges of this new environment. Uh, we know that now we speak about uh, STEM, STEM, STEM and STEM. And then a bit about social science, a bit about humanity, that also should be, may be. It is impossible to, to meet all those challenges without very deep knowledge of humanity, social sciences, since the, 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 the primary school, to application, application of this. Uh, then uh, it is important to have this international policy, international agreements. But <clears throat> as I said about my own, uh, own, own uh, experience, it's, it, it's so difficult, it is so difficult to have because the, the final decision in Europe is made by the uh, uh, trialogue where the council representing each and every member state can block decision. And for example, <coughs> when I left the uh, European Parliament, my last work was e-privacy uh, regulation, not GDPR, but regulation about the content of social media and privacy protection social media. It is still there because there is no, no uh, uh, say willingness among the member states to have this on table because of very strong opposition from the uh, monopolies, from the, the, all this industry who is making billions on this. So, the conclusion is it really, we are living in the time of greatest change. And in order to preserve leadership on human, at first we have to understand what it really is to be human. What are the strengths of being human? What are the weaknesses? What are the things we can and should give over to these new technologies? And what are our own capacities we have to develop to be capable to be uh, the responsible and creative partner and leader in this process, because that is an issue, how to remain partner and leader of these new technologies in this process of transformation. And namely, humanities and social sciences can answer this question. This question cannot be uh, uh, answered by any kind of uh, technological sciences or physics or mathematics. It's a problem of human psychology, of ethics, of moral, of the, 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 uh, this uh, whole uh, cultural heritage of humankind, how it to be involved. So that I wish all of you uh, that this project, that all other projects will be really uh, successful uh, to provide this important knowledge in a very true moment, not to be late, but to be ready so that we can say that this transformation will not go in a situation where social scientists and humanities will be marginalized and left aside. Thank you very much. Maybe you stay here, so if, you, if it's okay for the discussion. <laughs>
Okay, thank you very much, Mario, for this very important, <coughs> so critical so view, which is a very good way of opening the conference on this uh, digital transformation and technological so changes and, and the role of the social sciences and the humanities in understanding or trying to understand this and keeping us human. Uh, so we have time for questions, because Mario was very good in sticking to the times. So please, so it, it, I have this very strong lights, but I can see you, so I think. So raise your hand if you have any questions, yeah, please, from there. And the microphones will be, yeah, it's coming. Yes, thank you for your talk. I'm Minna Rukenstein from the University of Helsinki. And you were talking about some people, some of us becoming robots, that the machinic way of thinking is so internalized that we don't necessarily even want to be human anymore. So uh, in the kind of, uh, um, kind of uh, common sense understanding of what it means to be human. So I'm, I'm just like wondering if you could talk a little bit more about this kind of programmed sociality or programmed way of being in the world that you are observing. <laughs> so, uh, what I meant by that is that, uh, uh, you know, uh, the whole, uh, this logic of artificial intelligence is based on algorithms, algorithmization. And from the other side, it's based on this kind of uh, fracturization, the, the structurization of each and every action uh, in a very concrete way. Now, if you look at these practices we have in our societies, for example, in decision-making, uh, so-called, we call it in Estonia, <coughs> governance by Excel tables, uh, then this life uh, according to Excel tables, it, it is one of those signs for me, or these uh, tendencies, or even maybe factors for me, uh, which is really turning very much uh, humans uh, into automated uh, beings. Uh, and uh, uh, what is uh, the most dangerous thing that it seems very comfortable. And also, I, I have a feeling that for many, many people, this possibility to give up some of these functions of leadership, decision making uh, to the artificial intelligence, even function of self-expression uh, to these chat robots, it seems very comfortable. And it is comfortable namely because people already get used to that. And here, when we speak about education, then uh, it is very uh, worrying. I don't know how it's in other countries, but in our country we have discussed it a lot, how children, even at schools, they, they are not trained very much uh, for self-expression. Uh, they're even afraid of uh, stepping up and talking to people because they, they are used now only to talk through the smartphones, to, to talk with images, not with real people. And that means also that it's very easy then to, to adapt to this new situation where you even uh, don't need to have any kind of human, uh, human uh, communication. So uh, for me, this, uh, uh, this side of this whole process connected with consumers or connected with people themselves, the behavior of people themselves, it's, it's even, even more important than this other side, this uh, top-down regulations. And I found it very encouraging when I, I read this book about digital humanism uh, recently published uh, that there was an idea which already I have thought that really we have to think about how this process as a process where the predictability is really very low because it's a part of evolution and it is depending on the human behavior, how, how humans really will behave in their everyday lives, uh, how this whole technology will impact society as such. And for that social research and humanistic research and combined social humanistic, social cultural research is of utmost, utmost importance. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 
well, it was one question from there before, and, and I guess that's all because we, we must move to, and after that to the following speech. Unfortunately, yes, the schedule is very tight. Um, thank you, Professor Loristin. So my name is T. I'm working for the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime. So I look at everything from an organized crime perspective because you mentioned that you were behind the GDPR team. So I wanted to know your opinion about um, the trade-off between privacy and um, security or safety. Because for example, with encryption, it has made it much harder to investigate crime um, or you know, to, to have digital evidence um, for encrypted services like WhatsApp or Signal, for example, that, that these platforms have been used to, say, distribute child sexual abuse materials. So this is always a really hard um, trade-off. So what is your opinion on it? Thank you very much, really. This kind of trade-offs, that is the core of the issue, really, because uh, uh, it is also culturally bound. If we now take privacy itself, then uh, all research is showing that uh, this uh, idea of privacy, uh, interpretation of privacy, is very different from culture to culture. But the most big difference now is between generations. And for that, these kind of trade-offs, they're always uh, socially and culturally bound. They cannot be standardized and prescribed. Uh, and, uh, the possibility for trade-off is always there. And if we take <coughs> other values or other areas of life, like labor market, for example, we know that this uh, new technology will bring enormous changes to the labor market. But again, there are cultural differences in the labor situations, in the traditions, in the labor ethics, uh, in the understanding of people, of value of their work. And again, the trade-offs will be very different, whereas there one side is uh, to have more leisure time, the other side is to have more money. We know it's a very, very simple choice in all, all research, but it's also very different in different countries, or in, in, in different groups of people. So uh, for that, again, we, we, we have to we have to teach decision makers, we have to teach people who have developed technology uh, that this kind of choices, they, are, they, are, they cannot be easily uh, programmed and algorithmicized. There is a space which should be left for human decision making. Well, thank you very much once again, Mario. And Our next speaker is Dr. Taras Federko, uh, who is a lecturer in organized crime and corruption at the University of Glasgow. He is a political and economic anthropologist, and his research explores relations between power, profit, and morality. He works uh, with topical issues such as offshore corruption, corporate resistance to regulation, oligarchy, and war. He's writing a book on the transformation of the conflicts, uh, of the transformation about the transformation of and the conflict within the Ukrainian journalistic profession following the Maidan revolution. The topic of his speech today is digital publics and the political of economy of war in Ukraine. Please join me in welcoming Taras Federko. Thank you. Um, do we need to move this? Or? Right, so good morning. It's 8 on my, uh, eight a.m. on my, so I, I think I have this, so it might actually oh, interfere. Right. So it's 8 a.m. on my watch, and I apologize, because I don't function at this time usually. Um, so if I misstep, then you know, um, I'm just still sleeping. Right. Um, there we are. So good morning, everyone, and I'm very, very pleased that I'm here at the kickoff meeting of Chance, and uh, I have the honor with Professor Loristin of kicking off the discussions for the day, and I hope there's going to be plenty of those, and I wish very, very productive discussion. There's many of you here, gosh. Um, and I'm also very grateful to the organizers for inviting me to speak about something that's a very new topic for me, and it's, it's part of this new reality that I found myself in as a Ukrainian citizen, as researcher since the invasion also a little bit before. Um, 
So I wrote this amazing paper that goes into the complexities of the matter. Believe me, you have to believe this. And then I was told that I have 20 minutes. And um, so you have to think that behind the really skeletal kind of presentation that I'm uh, doing here, there is a lot of thought and analysis. There isn't. And as Professor Lauriston has, has said, this is also a story that began with a dream and ended with analysis of Facebook posts and a database. So it's, it's kind of its own disappointments to it. Um, so I'm just going to just str uh, jump straight into it and sketch out the role of digital publics in the organization of warfare and wartime solidarity in Ukraine based on the research project that I began um, um, as a, a British Academy Fellow at the University of St. Andrews before I, I went to my new uh, job, the ridiculous job title at the University of Glasgow in October 2021. So it's been going on for a while now. Um, and I have to say that if it wasn't in the beginning, by now it is plainly clear, the, the Russo-Ukrainian war or the Russian invasion of Ukraine is a profoundly transformative event of global significance, that the reverberations and global ramifications of which we, we're going to witness for years to come, and we don't know what they are yet. For the people of Ukraine, the Russian invasion is a calamity comparable on, on scale and kind only to the Second World War in the character of the warfare and in its transformative effects. And by some estimates, of, um, so far the war has left more than 100,000 Ukrainian combatants and civilians dead, and more than 200 non-fatally wounded. The Ukrainian GDP fell by at least a third in 2022. 10 million people, a quarter of the population at least, were displaced in one way or another. One million people are directly involved in fighting. At the same time, however, the networks of solidarity and political alliances that this war is forging, both among the masses and among the elites, are already changing the shape of the Ukrainian politics and the organization of the war itself. And this is really what I want to talk about today. The war has mobilized Ukrainians on an unprecedented scale. And this mobilization built on repertoires of civic action, networks connecting civic activists to the military, and on ways of using digital media that took some eight years since 2014, the beginning of the war in Donbass, to build up and to spread. Thus, last year, 60% of Ukrainians said that they supported internally displaced people, refugees, and combatants, either financially or in kind. So, of course, this tells us that people want to think of themselves, that they support others, but it also sheds a different light on this familiar story that we've been hearing um, from sociologists and political scientists from the West that Ukraine does not have a civil society until, of course, it turned out that it had one. Now, does this work? Yeah. As a military crowdfunding activist and comedian, Serhii Pratula has said in his testimony to the US Congress in last December, Quote, it is difficult to divide Ukrainian society into civilians and military during this war. It is more accurate to divide it into people who defend the country and people who bring uh, them the bullets. I'll come back to Pratula in a minute. But for now, I want to say that it is impossible to understand what he's talking about without paying attention to the civic and civic military networks that have mobilized to raise funds for both military and humanitarian ends, sometimes blending them, um, and the role of digital media and communication in this. Much has been written about the way in which digital media are transforming the character of war today, and one recurring argument is that it links people up in the battlefield and in the rear in new ways, changing the forms of participation for, in warfare and the broader, in the broader war effort. I'm an anthropologist, and I look to my own kind for inspiration, or the insular, I know. But um, one of the ideas that anthropologists have used to capture the relationship between media and participation in social milieus is that of the public. Literary scholar Michael Warner, um, in 20 years ago, described publics as, quote, the social spaces created by the reflexive circulation of discourse. Um, and anthropologists, for example, Sue Gall and De Gran and others, have built on this to explain that publics are created through the circulation of discourses as people hear, see, or read a message and then engage it in some way. Publics rely on a different media to create mutual awareness among participants. As my colleague Andy Grant has put it, quote, publics presuppose some shared interest or outlook that mediates how people relate to and participate in the production, consumption, and evaluation of discourse. Publics are amorphous, they are anonymous and impersonal, and really what it takes for a public um, to emerge 
is for people to collectively orientate a circulation of discourse or circulation of a certain media object. So of course digital, digital publics are no exception and online images such as these in calls such as the ones that Pertula issues to his Facebook publics to donate to the military effort are an example of sort of public making events or public making forms of discourse um, and um, media objects. And so now I want to talk about the way that in Ukraine, since the beginning of the war in Donbass, but per particularly with the invasion, digital publics interact with other forms of social organization, and such as personal networks or markets, to shape the flows and distribution of war resources and the organization of warfare itself. So in the remaining time, I'll talk about civic mobilization for the war, the role of digital media in it, and some ways that, we can, uh, that these can be studied using the affordances of the digital media itself. Now, to Pratula. He's Ukraine's second best-known comedian, of course, after Zelensky. And just imagine the, as people say now, this timeline, right? The career of a comedian, you begin cracking bad jokes and then you end up, or a president, worse. And like many um, publicly prominent figures in 2014, with the annexation of Crimea and the start of the separatist troubles in Donbass, Serhi Pratula began to use his public status and his publics to raise funds for the Ukrainian military and militias. I'll say, that, um, I'll say why that was necessary in a minute. But th this activity led him to launch a foundation, which kind of provided legal protection for him, that by 2022, before the invasion, was one of the largest and kind of one of the two pro professionalized uh, military crowdfunding operations in Ukraine. And after the invasion, it scaled up dramatically. The shift in scale can be seen in these photos, and of course, the crowdfunders are very well aware of that. Right, so, so you, you see here, you know, them distributing food and clothes, and those are millions of hryvnias and hundreds of thousands of dollars or euros in, um, in drones. So you see this in pictures like this, um, and um, that's 100 DJI Mavic 3 drones. Um, off-the-shelf wedding photography drones, as one Ukrainian minister called them, that are used for reconnaissance, target spotting, or unfortunately also improvised bombardment by both sides in the war. And that's about 200,000 euros of them. And it takes the foundation a day, sometimes a couple of hours to fundraise them. Increasingly more time because people don't donate, donate to them, but uh, increasingly takes more time. Um, and I've chosen in this presentation not to show you the footage that's taken with these drones, but I'm sure you have seen that footage, uh, whether it was for artillery strikes or um, for the dropping of improvised munitions and bomblets on, uh, on enemy troops. Um, where am I? So like many others, Pratula fundraises online, and there is no time to go into much detail about how he does that, um, but I just say that for him and for others, and appeals to anonymous digital publics are just one of the sources, one of the forms of fundraising and one of the sources of, of revenues. There are others and parties and kind of civic movements organized through in-person connections and, and uh, sort of established political institutions. And I have to say that there is a big difference in how Ukrainian and Russian or pro-Ukrainian versus pro-Russian publics um, organize and uh, crowdfunders organize for this. Um, and we can talk about it later in the discussion if you want. But certainly social media has made most of these mobilizations possible in, in a very obvious and direct way. And I'll, I'll talk about that uh, a bit more. But now, why were these mobilizations and crowdfunders necessary in the first instance, right? And how did they come about? Ukraine emerged as an independent state in 1991 as one of the most militarized countries in Europe. It inherited a stockpile of Soviet nuclear weapons, around 40% of the Soviet armed forces, and approximately 30% of the Soviet defense industry. 40%, if I'm, if I'm right, of the Soviet officer corps uh, were um, Ukra Ukrainian-born, if not necessarily Ukrainian. And the country's GDP in the 1990s fell uh, circa 60% between 1990 and 1999. And of course, the country could not maintain a military of its size, and then of course there were neighbors, and uh, distant helpers like the US who were telling Ukraine that it should not maintain independent military in uh, Europe that has reached the end of history. Army personnel was dismissed, military assets were gradually decommissioned, mothballed or sold off to places like Mozambique and Angola and, or the DRC. And many Ukrainian military servicemen and officers stationed in... Um, oh, I'm running ahead. And as this was happening, the military expenditure was also uh, gradually declining, and it reached its uh, low point, its nadir, in 2013. We know what happened afterwards. 
So when Russian troops in disguise started seizing administrative buildings in Crimea in late February 2014, many Ukrainian military servicemen and officers stationed on the peninsula defected to Russia. Soon it also became clear that in the Donetsk and Luhansk regions, where a separatist uprising was gaining place with Russia's help, the central government could not count on its military and on security apparatus either. And here is who came to help. Into this void created by the military weakness of the Ukrainian state and Ukrainian elites and the breakdown of center periphery lines of authority stepped volunteer militias often drawn from among the participants of the Maidan revolution in, in Kyiv and in the regions. At the same time, to compensate for the poor material conditions of the military and to help these militias, civilian activists started to supply everything from food to flak jackets to sniper optics to off-road vehicles and artillery targeting software and a lot of things that I should mention because they were illegal at the time to, um, to the militias and the regular army. This mobilization helped to prop up the armed forces and national guards of Ukraine at a crucial moment. In the first year of the war, the civil society took upon itself a, a number of functions elsewhere reserved for the sovereign state, which made lots of people very nervous, bringing the limited war in Donbass, officially called an anti-terror operation, Rather, iron with rather ironic resonances with this you know, special military operation right now, to the lives of ordinary people far from the front line. Fast forward, in November 2021, against the backdrop of Russian um, amassing forces on Ukraine's borders, I went to Kyiv to start a new fieldwork project where I interviewed veterans of the regular military and militias, former revolutionaries, officials, and military crowdfunding volunteers trying to find out how they mobilized and what the mobilization led to in terms of the civic networks and their kind of, the, you know, the, the political afterlives of these military crowdfunding networks or of the militias. The volunteers I spoke with told me and that I'd come five years too late. After 2015, with protracted economic crisis and incorporation of militias into the regular forces, the crowdfunding volunteer movement subsided. It was mostly people like Serhii Pratula and others who professionalized who could survive, but they were fundraising by early 2021, uh, 2022, um, a fraction of what they used to fundraise in 2014. Between early 2014 and 2021, Ukrainian state's military spending increased by 72% reaching $5.9 billion, uh, or 3.2% of the GDP, which is quite a lot for Ukraine. In this process, the once dynamic field of crowdfunding activism became split between several oligopolists, so volunteer networks that had managed to professionalize and specialize their activities. Um, and one of these was an organization you might have heard about. It's called Comeback Alive, Povrne Zhrivim. And it... In early 2022, it allowed me, following a lie detector test, most nervous, like, the, it was crazy, um, allowed me to conduct participant observation in their offices, which was very, very crammed in downtown Kyiv, after um, they kind of reassured that I wasn't a spy. You know, there's all this joke that anthropologists are spies, apparently I'd make for a very, very bad one. But that was a shrine at the entrance um, of their tiny office. And they were the main crowdfunding agency. But, you know, it was strange to imagine that uh, a space, maybe the, you know, two rooms this size, would run the major crowdfunding operation for, for the Ukrainian military, one of the kind of two remaining ones. Interviews with Comeback Alive employees and their allies from other crowd, uh, crowdfunding networks painted a picture of the war in Donbass in 2014, 2021, that put informality, a beloved topic of post-socialist studies, squarely at the center of the organization of warfare with lasting consequences. Both militias and regular units relied on an informal economy of crowdfunding supplies. Food, tactical gear, bulletproof vests, ammunition for light weapons, drones, light vehicles. This in turn spawned more informality as militias such as right sectors volunteer, Ukrainian corps, or the Ukrainian volunteer army, and smaller informal combat groups were, um, that were enabled by such supplies could continue to fight, capturing weapons despite the mostly uh, positional character of warfare, which further allowed them to continue their operations in a kind of self-reinforcing cycle, sometimes leading to, uh, to the breakdown of ceasefire under the Minsk agreements, and certainly kind of winning for militias a bit more autonomy from the state for a time being. Um, the need to procure some of these supplies extended beyond civilian or dual-use items, such as thermal imagers or scopes, to ammunition, specialized light vehicles, such as sniper rifles and civilian drones for targeting, um, sometimes which are also equipped with sort of custom-made small munition drop-in mechanisms. And money raised from informal, um, kind of money raised in this way uh, would often uh, 
flow into European consumer markets where these drones and, and uh, kind of vehicles were uh, uh, procured. So in a sense, this crowdfunding economy depended on there being an already existing retail economy um, that enabled these forms of, as one anthropologist recently put it, um, non-Fordist um, distributed organization. Right? So we, kept, we can think about the different forms of social organization that kind of uh, end up being infrastructures for one another. And digital publics is not the only one. Uh, most informal armed units that emerged in early 2014 formalized and incorporated into state-run forces uh, with their former commanders um, coming into power in regional councils or in the parliament for a short period. And the cooperation in which this economy thrived created really densely interconnected civic networks that linked veteran groups with political parties, Western-funded NGOs, and state institutions. Now, in 2022, the Russian invasion has galvanized these networks, leading to a new explosion in the volume of crowdfunding support to the military, as well as to expansion of some old and formation of dozens of new militias, which, however, very quickly um, kind of inc incorporated into the state. So come back alive, for example, in, from that office in, in January, before the invasion, fundraised about 22 million euros, which was uh, in one month, which was the entirety of their um, 2020, 2021 income, and which, and they raised more than that in a single day on the day of the invasion. Since then, it's, it fell. But uh, over the course of, um, well, since, 20, since the invasion, they've uh, fundraised 7 billion hryvnias, or 176 million. Um, and it's on par, one organization on par with what National Bank of Ukraine has fundraised from the publics. Um, and it's kind of an indication of a much larger volume of support um, that flows through these networks. So. Comparing, to, um, comparing 2014 with 2022, we see two things. The first is that similarity of the, um, to the, uh, the first is that the similarity to the early period, uh, similarly to the earlier period, these emergent but by now much vaster networks um, stand to reshape Ukrainian politics for years to come, as they will be a recruiting ground for new civic elites and political blocs, bolstering some parts of the defense and security apparatus, weakening others and also um, bolstering some parts of the elites versus others. And I have to say there are risks there, risks of fragmentation, risks of political competition. The other is that the mobilization of militias and crown funders is not so much something that threatens the state monopoly on legitimate means of violence, as it was often understood, but in fact reorganizes the wielding of violence. It flexibly extends the reach of the state at a moment when the state struggles to kind of match the challenge of rapidly scaling up and mobilizing. A challenge which I have to say um, any European state in, in Eastern Europe, Western Europe would face. Uh, and I live in Britain, you know, so you can imagine um, what levels of state collapse I'm face. I sh sh shall not say more. Um, but drawing on Charles Tilly uh, and his notion of brokerage, we can understand crowdfunders and combat, um, combatant groups uh, that they supply as brokers of resources for the exercise and organization of violence and brokers of violence, respectively. Sometimes their relations um, are organized as alliances between different networks, but sometimes as hierarchical patronage, but often the civilian and the military are simply two formal organizational facades of the same networks. And what's important is that the networks that organize the logistics of this, they plug in to digital publics where the fundraising happens. And while some of these network, brokering networks operate in ways that are more familiar from classic anthropological or sociological studies of brokerage, for instance, through political parties or other positions of institutional prominence, they have also emerged people like Serhii Pratula or Come Back Alive, um, who leverage their influence over digital publics to raise funds and maneuver politically, and we do not yet know what um, they'll, uh, kind of where this will lead in terms of um, them potentially gaining political power. Um, and with this, I'll say thank you. And thank you, Taras, for this very illuminating uh, talk about how war making is changing, not only because of new technologies, but also the role of this very important the, public, the digital publics in it. Uh, so we have at least five minutes for questions, so please be. <laughs> Fast in raising your hand, and there's one over there so. in the middle. Sorry, yeah, I, I must stay here because otherwise I don't see anything. Hello, thank you. Ah, yeah. Hi, I'm here. Okay, yeah. Um, sorry. <laughs> hi. I wanted to ask you how would you prevent the weaponization of your findings? Um, 
by Russia. Like, if you're visualizing a whole social network of people raising money, how do we, how do we manage our findings in such a way that they can't be used against us? Thank you. Well, it depends on what sort of fun, fi findings and what sort of audiences, right? I mean, I'm not... I showed you what I could show to begin with. I showed you something that was safe to show, and you did not really see much in it. And I think this is the key point. Um, I'm uh, working with people who are and collecting data that uh, from the posters, from online public posts, uh, where people take an incredible amount of precaution in um, the sort of information that they post online, and they post it with a full awareness that um, they might be monitored. They more often fear not Russia, but Ukrainian security services, um, because of the, exactly the informality that's attending this kind of uh, crowdfunding networks. And they operate, sometimes they operate on the edge of, you know, so. Um, however, um, we do not collect any information that would not be public. There is various kinds of security encryption and other measures around uh, the database itself. I showed you an export of the database into a spreadsheet. You know, it's a not, this is not how the database looks. Um, and um, besides, you know, this database is something that will potentially one day become public for the use of other researchers. However, not until some period, certainly not, I say not until the end of the war, but unfortunately we don't know when the war ends. Um, but um, there's conflict actually there between data openness requirements from funders and security requirements of this kind of research. Um, and I could go on talking, right? I mean, there, are, there is no one silver bullet, but there is an overlap, overlapping system of partial measures that I think protect it. Um, and I hope that it's going to be enough. Thank you. So one more question we can take from, I think, from there. Um, how could you verify the credibility of these Facebook polls? Because especially for charities and donations, one trick is to pretend that you are getting donations to actually get real donations from somewhere else. Um, is the first thing, and how do you preserve these Facebook posts? Because from my experience, um, I'm also trying to do NLP across different social media platforms. They would be taken down like after just a few days, for example. Um, and are you sort of um, scanning across also private Facebook groups, such as open groups and so on? So. Yeah. Right, th thanks for the question. We do not collect any information that's in any private groups or elsewhere, so um, that's an easy no. We only collect what's public already, and um, this is quite labor-intensive because it, it, it's, it's not something that's done automatically. I mean, Twitter is a whole different, or was a whole different story until recently, um, and um, it's therefore it's quite costly to do it because there has to be a person, you know, doing this, um, and we preserve screenshots and 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 the text itself, and um, uh, in terms of verification, I, I have a cop-out, again, as an anthropologist, it's brilliant to be an anthropologist, you know, you don't have to pretend that you're working with truth, but I mean, we do not verify. Um, what this is shows, showing us, it's a, you know, we could say this is a moral economy, this is a, an economy of claims to social capital. There is a real underpinning, real flows of resources, the, f the question of verification and presentation is a problem for um, these crowdfunders themselves. There's a whole repertoire of accountability there that interests me as a researcher because it's going to influence you know, forms of transparency and accountability in, in Ukraine for, for years to come. Um, but suffice to say that what we do is, you know, the people working with me on this are investigative journalists in the past, people who've lost jobs because of the war. And they... Um, we cannot go into verification of donations, even though often people post checks and everything. I mean, I know it can be faked, right? Um, but it, it doesn't interest us. What interests us is the verification of relationships. So when someone claims our militia is part of this battalion, we're trying to verify that in, you know, with the methods familiar to you, triangulating, trying to collect information from at least two sources, sometimes asking expert sources on this. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a mixture, mixture of things. And it's a case of, you know, making the, the best out of a very, very imperfect field.
Thank you very much once again. Thanks.